right, ladies and gentlemen, um, we continue on to our next day of talking about a bigger picture and a bigger thing about not just social license, but where we are in the sports. I sent out a thing earlier in the year talking just to all the all of the different disciplines and all of the different breeds. And we, we kind of call them the five questions just where they ended up, but it was to try to determine really where people's minds are about what they think about the future. Where they are in their discipline, where they are um, in their breed about where the future of equestrian sport lies. And just to go over those for the, some of the people that um, were not part of that process, we sent out what are the four or five core concepts about your breed or discipline that are central to your belief or your promotion. Now, I've gone through an exercise like this in our sport because as the Olympic IOC basically said that equestrian sport needed to change, and those changes that happened that led up to Tokyo made us all in the three Olympic disciplines really start to look at our individual sports and what are the things that we are core concepts that we hold on to, and what are the things that you could let go? What are the things that you could change? What are the things on the periphery that actually don't make a huge difference to the core belief of what that sport is. My sport would have been absolutely one person, three different disciplines, one horse. That is a core concept that we would not let go. Um, and some of the other things could change, right? Some of the periphery things could change. And so we sent this question out basically to all of the breeds and disciplines of what are those core beliefs? And I will say that the responses and uh, I'm not going to really go into all the responses that we have here because I still think maybe there's a second round that we can go because there was a lot of different disciplines that or breeds and disciplines that took it very, very seriously. I mean, they took themselves apart. A lot of that would have actually ended up on the cards that you wrote yesterday, <laughs> right? Some of those periphery things that could change and that you wrote down on the cards, which was a huge response um, and went through that last night of where we are. And I think we're gonna talk about some of those things this afternoon. Um, and really looking at themselves about what is the core thing of whether it was a breed or whether it was a discipline, what is that core things that you believe of why you're doing it, right? And what are those core concepts that you really feel like nobody really could change no matter what? And the second one, question that we used is, where do you see your breed or discipline in five years or 10 years? Do you see yourself it's the same? Do you, we just ticking along in everybody's comfort zone, right? Or do you feel like there could be changes and looking at it from the outside, right? From the public side. And one of the things we talked about here in the last couple of days, or since yesterday is what concepts are we that we are we selling, right? What what are we promoting to the public that is different or what we like or we like because I keep thinking and Tom made reference to what's across the hall. Right? And could we celebrate and have a video, consistent video, and put it up here and we could celebrate and we could take it over to them and say, are you interested in it? Do you like it? Will you give us some money? <laughs> <laughs> and we all know that there are situations out there, and I know that I could put videos up because this tends to be what I do, put videos up that 80% of you in this room would cringe. And if we took it over there, you'd get thrown out of the room. And that is a big part of how we have to look at ourselves, right? Especially as we would like to grow, we would like to be interested in the public, we think that we have something that's valuable to promote, right? Beyond just the relationship, but also the sports side. And can we have them look at us and do, and should we ask them? And I believe always we should ask them, right? What do you think of this, right? Off the cuff, right? And or how you're promoting it, because I would like to take it into a different world and, and get that opinion. And so I think we always have to be willing to look at ourselves in that way. And how are we promoting our sport? And what are, what are we promoting? What are we, what are we taking out to the public? Right? Do we know that we can celebrate our relationship? 
we know that it is empathetic. We know that it is, uh, as I said yesterday, that really, and I'm 100% believer in it, that horses are good for humans, right? Not just the other way around. <laughs> but we all talk about the other way, right? But I actually think horses are really good for us as humans. How do we sell that? How do we put that out? How do we get that thought in the different sporting environments? And so I do believe that in the end, to look at ourselves, where are we in five or 10 years? Does it look the same as, are we just going to tick over, right? Or as we get more pressure from the outside, right? As there's more people that scrutinize us in right, left, and center. And then what possible changes, if any, do you see that are needed in your breeder discipline to promote and adhere to that five or 10 year outlook, right? Are there changes or do we think we just have it nailed? And I don't believe that any of us believe that we're, that we always have it nailed, right? We have to evolve, we have to change. It's not that you're changing against your core concepts, but how are you into a place where, you, what could you promote this thing that we all celebrate and how could we promote it better into a public light? Then the fourth question was, where do you see your breeder discipline in the broad aspect of equestrian sports as a whole? Not just your individual like, not just your individual desire, but how do you put that into the context as we have alluded to here in, these last couple, in this last day is that since the public doesn't differentiate one sport from another, and even one animal thing from another, there is that one side of, of people that we won't convince. There is 20% of the public that we will never convince because they are fully believe that any animal shouldn't be used for entertainment or sport as they go do their dog agility. <laughs> um, and so in the end, there are people that go, that really believe that. And that's not really probably the group that we're ever gonna convince, right? It's the other, and then there is 20%, 30% of the people up at the, that fully believe. So it's this middle ground people, right? That we can maybe have an influence on. And so where do you see, what changes do you see that support that concept of where you would be in five or 10 years? And then the last question is, do you see any threats to equestrian sports as a whole or your breed or discipline in particular? We, I think that is a very honest question that we have to look at ourselves, right? And again, I believe that a lot of that stuff has to be reached out to, how do we look at it from the outside? And are we willing to go to outside people that have nothing to do with this? And again, ask their opinion, right? Ask the opinion of the spectator that's in the stands that has come, ask the, the corporations that actually um, support us, uh, ask surveys wise that how do we get people to give their opinions about what they see. Because as I said yesterday, I, I am a huge believer that in the end is once you sell a ticket, right, once you sell a ticket, then you have to listen to what that person is going to want to see, what their opinion is, right? And most sports have to go there. Base, baseball has gone there in a long way, right? Because they're trying to shorten the game. Because they say their spectators are saying it takes I, I, it's take too long, right? Cricket is the same thing in England, right? Even worse than three day event, which takes four days. <laughs> Five day cricket, <laughs> right? Who's gonna stay in the stands that long? And cricket in, which is now in the Olympic games, right, for LA, Cricket is now changed. They still have their long format, right? But in the end, that one day cricket has exploded the sport around the world, right? Exploded, and they were willing to change. They were willing to listen to the spectators of what they want to see and how they want to do it and how they want to be entertained, knowing that in the public, the attention span for whatever reason seems to be gotten shorter. Right, probably because of that phone computer thing, right? So in the end, it, the attention span, which I don't, I, I think we just cave into that too much personally, but in the end where their attention span of entertainment wants to be shorter, how are we producing something in front of them that is entertaining? So those were the questions that we sent out. We're gonna, I'm gonna send them out again.
this year, um, or probably right after this meeting. And then maybe over the summer, we'll try to collate a little bit more of that information and present it out here maybe next year or at another forum that we can start to look at each one of the individual disciplines and come to you in your meetings and say, all right, what, what do you guys think about this? Because I think it's an important thing as a family, as a big family, that we look at our individual piece and we also look at the whole piece, right? Um, um, I want to uh, invite now uh, Dr. Kami Haleski up to the podium. Um, Dr. Haleski received her PhD in animal science with an emphasis in equine behavior and welfare from Michigan State. And her master's was also in animal science with emphasis on equine nutrition and exercise physiology. She worked at Michigan State for 25 years as coordinator of their horse management program. And during that time, she coached the collegiate horse judging team for 16 years and the introductory dressage team for six seasons. In 2016, Haleski began teaching at the University of Kentucky um, in the equine science management program where she teaches equine industry issues, co-teaches the equine senior capstone course, and teaches the multi-species animal behavior and welfare class. Her applied research interests revolve around equine behavior and welfare, horse and human interactions, sport horse welfare issues, and working equids in developing regions of the world. Kami has been actively involved in the International Society for Equitation Science as a council member and honorary fellow, and one of the recent publications was a co-authored piece in sustainability, Thoroughbred Racehorse Welfare Through the Lens of Social License to Operate with an Emphasis on U.S. Perspective. If any of you can read that, it is a fascinating article. Um, peer reviewed, um, the, you, it was, you were one of the authors, right? There were, it was a joint collaboration. It is a fascinating article. Um, and so this article has led to multiple uh, invited speaking opportunities like here, both in the US and abroad. So Gammy was uh, unfortunate to grow up on an Arabian farm where she helped her family with training, showing, breeding, and managing horses. And part of her PhD dissertation, she helped establish the annual animal welfare judging and assessment competition. This led to receiving the AVMA Humane Award for non-veterinarians. And Cami, and really why, uh, besides all of her accolades, um, she's here because she was part of the FEI uh, Equine Ethics and Wellbeing Commission that started in 2022, of which there were, there's like 10, 12, People. So, um, in uh, within again, in and out of the industry, um, and it has been kind of a revolutionary piece for driving a lot of things, including our process that we've started here um, for the FEI. It's worldwide. Um, so, I want to invite Dr. Cami Haleski up for uh, talk to us. Thank you. Good morning, it's good to be here. Uh, so last night as we were having dinner, we were talking about some of what took place yesterday, and I kind of came to realize I had the wrong presentation prepared for what we were supposed to go over today. Uh, so I dug around last night, dug around this morning, and decided that some of the information that came from our interim report in April of 23 was actually going to be more relevant. So if I have to read my slides once in a while, I apologize. Uh, this was pretty recently put together. I would also mention I am still really starstruck to be here. There are a lot of names here that I have known much of my life, and it's just fascinating to be here. Um, I've been a horse behavior geek since I was probably about nine years old. Uh, my dad gave me my first pony to train when I was nine, my first horse to train when I was 12. And so from the time I was nine-ish, I would sit out in the pasture and I would just watch what our horses on the farm were doing. And that's probably not totally a normal thing that nine-year-olds do, but I thought it was super, super cool. And even though my dad had been training for decades, he gave me the space to do some things my way. So 
at a time, think about how long ago this was, we're talking early 70s, um, at a time when positive reinforcement was not really something we talked about very much, if I wanted to spend an hour convincing my horse to go through a mud puddle and use little treats and scratches to do it, he tolerated it. It wasn't his way, it wasn't how he had been taught, but he gave me space. And that was a really amazing opportunity, again, especially when you think back to what typical horsemanship and horse training looked like that many decades ago. So a lot of this is excerpts from the Sports Forum. And this was led by our chairperson, Natalie Warren, who I've actually known a really long time. She was actually a member of my PhD committee. And so this is kind of like a whole full circle situation. So I'm gonna talk just a little bit about our role, a little bit about the responses we've had, and then talk about some of the recommendations that have been put forward for the FEI recognizing that a lot of those can be modeled by USEF. Uh, and I continue to think USEF is really pushing forward in a beautiful way. I'm sure there are some of you that are concerned about this or this or this, but from my observations, you guys are doing awesome. So Ingmar DeVos talked about equestrian sport and FEI activities talking about them being under public scrutiny and wanting to embrace that to drive change and shine the spotlight on our stakeholder, the number one stakeholder, the horse. Uh, one place where we sometimes bantered a little bit with Ingmar was he wanted to really focus on the partnership. And I've heard that a couple times. And I just think people need to be a little careful we can't assume a partnership because that implies everything in the interaction is good. When the interaction is good, it's a wonderful thing. But just because a horse and a human are interacting doesn't always make it a partnership. So we did need to bring that back to Ingmar every once in a while. Yes, we want to promote positive horse-human interactions. We can't assume they all are positive. So, just to put some faces with some names, the top line, we considered ourselves to be critical friends. We tried to tell the internal FEI folks from the beginning, um, we are going to give you a hard time. That's why you've asked us to be involved. Please think of us as friends of the equine industry, but people that want to see some change. So we were asked to provide independent, objective advice from an ethical standpoint, from a welfare standpoint, develop a strategic approach to help guide decision making, provide recommendations that would hopefully, hopefully enhance social license to operate, and that the FEI would then take these to heart. And that's what we're hoping the Mexico City meeting will have done. And then when it gets to April of 24, we will see how they're planning to proceed with those recommendations. There are definitely different lenses when we look at social license to operate, when we look at equine welfare, are we looking at it as us, the participant from the human side? Are we looking at, at it from the horse perspective? Are we looking from the public's? lens when they look at these things. And in many ways, some of our harshest critics are not just the general public, it's equestrians who do more like backyard ownership, weekend trail rides, maybe they show in a different discipline. When I go into my class for equine industry issues each semester, the harshest critics of horse racing are people that show horses in another discipline. And I often find myself having small group conversations to really kind of press them and say, all right, but don't you do this with your Western Pleasure horse? Don't you do this with your saddle seat horse? Don't you do this with your reining horse? Whatever it might be. And 
when you force them to look through that different lens, sometimes they come up with a very different perspective. But I have them for 15 weeks. I have them 50 minutes, three times a week. And I can make a lot of impact in that amount of time. Most of the time, we don't get that many minutes to push our message. One of the surveys we did fairly early on looked that a fairly high percentage of the general public is concerned about equine welfare. As I mentioned yesterday, chances are these are people that at least know something about the horse industry. Chances are that we didn't have people that care nothing about horses that took the time to answer that survey. So you always have to understand there's a little bit of human pressure there when you look at your survey results. 67% of the public felt that welfare uh, standards were not adequate or would be tricky to provide for in a certain sport. Uh, they might be concerned about what little they know about the horse show world. They might be concerned about what little they know about the horse racing world and the dozens of other disciplines that are out there as well. Uh, you know, people talk about weekend trail riding as if it's this beautiful, perfect thing. I promise you, I've been to a lot of trail riding sites on weekends. It's not all good. You see some really sloppy horsemanship, some hideous tack fit, and some complete lack of understanding of horse behavior. So just because people are doing something totally for fun doesn't always mean they have it perfect either. Uh, I mentioned yesterday these six priority focus areas. Everything from people talking about super tight nose bands, bit concerns, martingale concerns, rope cure concerns, uh, to things about what are the horses doing when they're at the home farm, do we have our officials being given enough power to enforce things or at least make a report. All of those qualitative statements kind of fit into these six boxes. So some of the recommendations, we did tons and tons of research looking into what articles are out there related to some of these concerns. Um, you know, a lot of times you can find out what people's concerns are by looking at lay people, publications, Equus, Horse and Rider, Pollock Report, things along that line. I spend a lot of time looking through social media. And I'm going to tell you a little differently from what a few other people have said. I think you need to invest time in social media. Um, you don't always have to actively engage, but it is a great way to take the pulse and the temperature of the industry if you are reading through what other people are thinking. I'm in a group in the United Kingdom called Coffee with Horse Lovers. Lisa Ashton runs it. They try to keep it kind of sciencey, but it's a great way for me to figure out some of the big talking points that are going on. And quite honestly, when that whole pentathlon thing went viral, I got all my information from there about 12 hours ahead of when I started getting it from the US. Uh, when we're looking at peer-reviewed pieces, we would, we actually assigned various universities that wanted to be helpful. So for example, Charles Sturt University in Australia, Haley Randall and her colleagues, they did a ton of research when it came to the double bridle issue. And then they sent us the synthesized material so we could then address that and provide potentially evidence for people that had concerns. Um, talking with other equine welfare experts, it's a reasonably small world of people who do, let's say, presentations at scientific meetings around the world related to equine behavior and equine welfare. So if we got stuck, we tried to go out to, all right, who are the last several people that published on this particular topic? And we had some small working groups. So I was part of the education working group, worked with the uh, FEI Education and Officials Commission, and 
they are doing some amazing work. As I mentioned to a few of you yesterday, we need to make it more accessible so people can find it better, uh, but the material itself has been well done. So these were some of the early recommendations. I hate this term. They were supposed to be quick wins. And so we, we had heard tons from people before we even officially started. We had people talking to us about, can't you make the double bridle optional? If somebody actually wants to show without a double bridle at high level dressage, shouldn't that technically be okay? Seemed innocent. It went wild, crazy. Uh, you know, if you followed any of that, you already know what the statements were. Uh, but there was a lot of concern that we were dumbing down dressage, and I, I, I don't know where it will eventually land. The spur thing, as far as spurs not being absolutely, totally mandatory, a lot of countries were already heading that direction, so that did not cause quite as big of a controversy. Nose bands being super tight. Many of you will have seen a fairly viral picture of uh, a flash nose band that is so tight on a horse's muzzle that it's like deeply indenting the skin. Everything about the horse's face has that pain grimace scale that we're supposed to be looking out for. Um, the photographer of that person doesn't even want credit they don't want people to affiliate them with that picture, which probably also contributes to why the picture has gone so viral. I think a lot of people are going to gradually start buying into, let's not have crazy tight nose bands, but we have this subset of people that is really upset that we might ask a high level dressage horse to tolerate a piece of plastic going on their nose between the cavison and that, no, or between the cavison and the nasal bone. If we can train those horses to tolerate a tent where the judge sits, I'm pretty sure we can get them to tolerate plastic on their nose. So that one troubles me. Um, this uh, field of play and being able to pull a horse right then and there even without necessarily having approval from all of the ground jury. I believe that is in place. I believe that one happened. Uh, education group, that one is working. And in theory, we'd love to see a group that is fundraising to do more research. So some of these areas where people say, well, we're not sure we have enough proof yet. Maybe somebody can do a research project. Um, but I will also mention there are occasional projects that it would be hard to justify on ethical grounds to conduct that research. Um, I've talked to a few people about big lick horses in the Tennessee walking horse industry. I recognize that does not fall under your purview. But how on earth would I get approval to take 50 horses and make sure I soar half of them and don't soar half of them? to find out if it actually causes them pain to sore them. If you were here yesterday, you've already seen this. Whatever group we're working with, whatever racing group, whatever showing group, we need to be thinking about these parameters in terms of maintaining our social license to operate and enhancing equine welfare. Um, and hopefully most people are on board here not just to make sure we have a sport in 10 years. I mean, that's important. But the real driver, I think, has to come like from your heart, that you want to do better for horses. You want horses to have a good welfare situation in their competition lives. So these were a few of the recommendations. Every now and then, you're going to see a spelling that looks weird to you. That's because the, the speaker that put this together is uh, originally from the United Kingdom, now in New Zealand, Natalie Warren. So just bear with me when you see a, a word that looks a little different. Again, we're gonna talk extensively at the March Equitation Conference, Equitation Science Conference in New Zealand about what comprises a good life for horses. Do we have things that are measurable and quantitative 
and how can we enhance the ability to look at the qualitative things that maybe are a little more subjective. Like, I feel very comfortable walking around a warm-up ring and picking out three to five horses that are distressed, unhappy. Um, every once in a while, I'm very grateful that I don't see that. But the majority of time, there's a handful of horses that I find troubling as I look at what's going on. How can we make that not just Kiami's opinion, but something that we can back up to other people? Uh, again, moving forward on this good life concept, how do we bring more measures to that? And how do we, what we call, socialize that idea? How do we get more people in positions of power and just plain owners of horses to embrace those different thoughts? Um, again, looking at this commitment to social license to operate. I recognize there are people within the competition horse, show horse industry, that are less inclined to be okay with the world of racing horses, but in some ways, they actually got on this bandwagon a few years ahead of us, um, especially if you look to United Kingdom, Ireland, Australia. They started working on this more quickly, and it's partly because they are so dependent on the betting public. And if they don't have people going to the races or at least clicking on their phone to make some bets, their sport won't survive. Uh, this was talking about what are some of your big concerns. This was from some of those earlier surveys that were done. And, you know, it would be nice if we could do all of these things. I was talking with somebody yesterday that talked about we need to go back to the basics of horsemanship. We need, you know, those people that used to take a sleeping bag and lay out in the barn next to the colicky horse. Are we still having that? Do people still value that level of horsemanship? This one you've seen now a couple times. People are more concerned about the safety and welfare of horses than they are about the humans that work with them. Um, I don't find that terribly surprising. A lot of us put our horses' needs way out in front of our needs. There's a funny little TikTok going on around right now. And yes, I, I watch TikTok because I learn so many things about the world from TikTok. Uh, but they have this horse and, and the girl's putting brightly colored matching wraps on it and this gorgeous expensive blanket and a sleazy on the neck and I don't remember what else she was doing. Every hair was separated in the tail. And then she looks like a hot mess, and she's got hay in her hair, and she just bends over and shakes out some of the chaff, and then she's got disgustingly dirty hands, and she grabs a sandwich and starts eating it. So it, 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 it's kind of true, I get it. So in terms of trust, this voice for the horse thing, is one of our big recommendations. We would really like to see FEI have a person or a small committee that their bottom line is always about the voice of the horse. It's not about worrying financially, can we do this? Legally, can we do this? That's gonna be another person's role. There were multiple things when we were presenting to FEI that we would give our recommendation, and the lawyer that was sitting in on the meeting would say, oh, mm, can't do that. It's like, don't tell us we can't do it. Figure out a way that this can happen. Now, I don't know how that will go long term. Um, active bystanders, again, this was a little bit addressed. Can people report you know, the whole see something, say something. Do we have mechanisms in place to let that be easy-ish? 
Many years ago when I did a lot of coaching of horse judging teams, uh, I would often take a team to Arabian Nationals. And it's amazing, unfortunately, the bad things you see at 11 p.m. or midnight going on in warm-up rings. And I wanted to know how to report a couple of the things I had seen. At that point in time, it was going to cost me a decent amount of money to file a complaint. That has been changed, correct? Yeah. So we need to help people know if you see bad stuff, we need it to be reported. Um, again, ensuring the horse's interest, ensuring we keep looking for new evidence. You know, I'm this big promoter of turnout for horses, high level competition horses. Racing horses, I realize at racetracks it's going to be really tricky to implement that. That doesn't mean just because it's tricky that we can't figure out a way to do it. Um, how, how do we figure out how many hours of turnout is absolutely necessary? Catherine Howe, many of you will have heard of her, very famous equine behaviorist. She's not sure it needs to be much more than an hour per day at least during the competition season. Um, I'm not sure myself what it needs to be. What I know it needs to be is not zero. Tack and equipment, like I said, came up over and over and over, using the whip in the wrong way. You know, in terms of learning theory, if you're using it as a punishment, as an act of anger, it is not going to be teaching the horse anything. Uh, draw reins have come up a lot of times, and you know some of these other aspects just went over and over and over. Uh, this one is interesting, and you hear it in multiple ways. The biomechanically incorrect, and if you read the whole qualitative statement, they're talking especially about dressage horses, especially those super, super fancy movers that in their mind at least are not moving in a biomechanically correct way to what all the old test books from the classical masters tell us about dressage riding. So to the dressage community, that is something that we heard it come up enough as a very specific concern. I think it has to be addressed. A lot of people, a lot of the public did want to know what's going on in the horse's life when they're not at the showgrounds. Um, I would love to see, you know, as we more and more have these ring cameras at our various houses. <coughs> I don't think it's all bad to think about having a certain amount of monitoring going on at the various competition venues. I know there's a lot of people concerned about privacy issues and so forth. Uh, my real, real dream, if somebody is an absolutely brilliant inventor, is to have a way to have a microchip in the horse that can actually be kind of like a functional MRI. And if the horse gets X number of times of abusive training, if you've ever seen the documentary on Romanian orphans that had no maternal care early in their life, and you see how the brain MRI flashes almost zero colors, whereas the child that had a nurturing environment, even if it wasn't its genetic mother, then all the colors of the brain are doing the right things. I would love to see more of that information on horses. We're not there yet. That doesn't mean we can't get there. Engaging with the public. Sometimes we have a tendency to treat the public like they're idiots. And the racing world has talked a lot about, well, if we just educate people about the importance of the whip, or if we just educate people about why the horses have to be in a stall, they're going to be okay with it. That's a lot of times a poor argument. For the most part, we are not going to educate ourselves out of this dilemma. Education is important. 
It's especially important for the stakeholders most involved, but to try to think just because we teach people more about this or this or this doesn't automatically mean that they're gonna love the practice. Um, I do think that people are getting better about the transparency thing. If something negative happens, we have to just talk about it. It doesn't make any sense to just try to cover it under the rug. Uh, now, having a good spokesperson that can talk in times of crisis is valuable. And some of my colleagues tried 15 years ago to get the racing industry to have better crisis communications. And it's really only been in the last couple years that they have gotten kind of a handle on crisis communications. And so I would encourage our competition world that we need to make sure we stay on top of that also. Not surprisingly, they want to know what happens to the horses after they're done competing. A huge issue in the racing world where your horses only have, let's say on average, two and a half years of active competition, they want to know where these off the track thoroughbreds go, where the off the track standard breads go. Um, that question hasn't been really, really big in the horse show world, but I think it's going to be more and more popular as time goes on. Looking at the um, public opinion, their opinion of social license to operate, and monitoring that every now and then. Uh, doing these surveys, it's super expensive. I don't remember the total number that FEI ended up putting toward that. But that was a pretty big ask when we needed to request what it was going to cost to run the different surveys. But that will be one of the ways that we try to keep our industry alive is having a sense of how the public feels about these things. Uh, the next slide will show the equestrian charter. Some of you will probably have already gone to the FEI key documents and looked at some of that. Uh, we are hopeful that we can get all owners, all grooms, all officials, uh, trainers, etc., to sign this charter. Now, a lot of times, unfortunately, people just sign a document and they don't really read it. So how we make sure that people actually read before they sign is still going to take some thought. You know, if it was my college students, I could force it to be an assignment. And they have to address some of that information in their little assignment. A little more difficult in what we're talking about. So um, I understand it's a privilege to involve horses in sport. I commit to respecting them as a sentient creature, and I will continue, continually develop my understanding of behavior and welfare. And I've just been alerted that I'm at my 30 minutes, so I'm gonna try to go a little more quickly over these next few. Uh, Natalie is really good at creating things that all start with the same letter. So she did this very nice six strategic enablers that will be very important for our way forward. Fit to compete came up so many times. And I had officials contact me through Facebook and say, look, I officiated last weekend. I saw horses that did not look fit to compete, but we couldn't get an overall agreement. There are people who are very concerned that as we have more and more summer and winter venues, we have horses competing more year round, less likely to have time off. Um, those are some of the qualitative pieces that came up. Uh, a few qualitative comments that Catalina Visser thought were incredibly telling. Pain indicators in horses don't always seem to be recognized. One of the things I mentioned yesterday uh, right now I can't remember if it was in my talk or to a one-on-one -on -one conversation. We ask a lot of our judges and there's only so many decisions as a judge you can make in the window of time that horse is in front of you. So there are times I think we may need more supporting staff 
that can help with some of these decisions. So our various stakeholders, everybody, everybody in this room, everybody you work with has a role to play. It's not going to be a safe and fair way forward to put this off onto somebody else. Uh, the websites, both for FEI Campus, that has the education module, modules, and the EEWB, Equine Ethics and Wellbeing Commission, you can have pretty much all the key documents. Um, you, can, you can read for hours and hours if that would somehow make you happy. So the materials are there if you decide to look them up. And with that, David, do we have time for questions or we'll just keep rolling? A few questions or comments. I'm never sure what to think if I have stunned people into silence. So what you just been over were your recommendations. Okay. I'm just clarifying. Okay. I, I just clarifying what all this that you've been over like the numer numbered things and everything, those are recommendations that not have not, at this point, been adopted by the FEI. There are a few that have been adopted already, but for the most part, it is recommendations that FEI is supposed to address at the April meeting. Okay. But one thing we said loud and clear to all the national federations is you folks don't have to wait. There is nothing stopping national federations from marching forward. Okay. What, what is this, what is USEF doing in terms of those things at this point? That's kind of what we're here. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, you know, part of that is here. I think the equine charter is going to be something that we could actually put out there quite quickly. And um, so the FEI is definitely looking at some of those recommendations of how to do it, um, how do we implement some of these things, right? And so that is kind of where they are right now, right? And that conversation is going to happen, be presented a little bit at the sports forum, which is in April, and then on to it would whatever has to be passed by the General Assembly, which would be next year, which is in Oman, I think. Um, so the sports forum is the one where some decisions of what is what can be implemented now will be brought out into that into the public environment. So we have a board meeting next week, I think, about starting to discuss it. Discuss it. Anybody else? Yep. Will. Um, I, I, I liked what you said when you said that one of the the, the toughest critics on other disciplines are fellow equestrians in a different discipline. So my question is, um, what level, what layers did, did y'all go into in the recommendations to the FEI? And I'll use the nose bands, for example, because um, that's a huge topic in our sport. Um, what level went into that discussion? I know you made the mention of a flash nose band, but there's a, nowadays there's so many different types of nose bands. Um, I, I had an experience where I have, you know, a, a horse that I'm currently competing. Um, he goes cross country in a snaffle bit, but I ride him in a figure eight. And it's not crank tight, but it's tight enough that he can't cross his jaw. So my question would be, what, what layers did y'all go into with the FEI of, you know, what type of nose band, what, what bit is in the horse's mouth with a certain type of nose band? Because there's so many levels of education that, like you're saying, the toughest people are the critics of other disciplines that don't understand those layers. So, and I, I may not be making sense, but how much of, um, leeway is the wrong word, but that umbrella of, uh, effect of nose bands can't be tied, well, it might can depend on what type of bits in the horse's mouth. So. Is there room for discussion within the FEI, within the different layers that would go into, that would go under the umbrella effect of your key bullet points? And I think I'm following the question. Uh, I, I know there is a TAC uh, committee within FEI. So to a large degree, 
We've told them, here are the qualitative concerns your group needs to continue to pursue because obviously noseband issues for endurance, noseband issues for vaulting are going to be very different from what they are for show jumping or for eventing. But if you've seen the picture I'm specifically referring, most people have, again, at least 80 or 90 percent of the people in this room are going to say, no, that's, that's not right. Uh, you know, whether it's two fingers here or one and a half, you know, then there's a little more debate. We do know when there's no fingers here, uh, Orla Doherty from Ireland did some amazing research. Hillary Clayton from Michigan State did some awesome research. We know when that nose band is super tight, you get more internal lesions on the inside of the mouth. Um, but I also have had horses that, at least for a small window of time of training, sometimes needed, not to the level of the picture, but a tighter noseband than what I might ideal, ideally value. But a lot of that is going to come down to the TAC and equipment committee. Yeah, there's two things, just sorry, I got my little FEI hat on right now. So I'm chair of the eventing uh, committee for the FEI, and uh, so where that went, so the recommendations came out of here, and then it went to the individual uh, discipline committees, right, for them to deal with it. So, and one of our things was like, wanted to make sure there was a differentiation of how we would all look at it, because generally, eventing is a snaffle sport, right? Dressage generally at that top level is a double bridle sport, and we had this thing with bits years ago, like, you know, you can't put them all in the same basket because they're different. And it's a little bit the same thing with the noseband thing. Like, how do we measure it? How do we use it? Um, you're right, because uh, in the dressage world, it's going to be a cavison, right? In our world, we use, you know, figure eights, as you said, or flash nosebands. And so how does it get measured? And that is a conversation that each discipline went back and talked about it or asked questions, and then this tech and equipment group that, it, that is straight across the board is starting to make, it's also looking into it, and that is why there hasn't been an outright, so it's a year and a half now, yeah. since it came out, there actually hasn't been actually a clear 100% determination of this is what's going to happen because of the different sports that we're in. Right. Any other comments or questions? No? There we go. Well, thank you very much. Thanks. And uh, before we kind of wrap up, I thought this morning, I thought we might throw a, a subject out into your tables <clears throat> and uh, kind of give everybody the same question. And it is a process that came up here, is about whether a federation or a group um, can deal with some, uh, a, I wouldn't say abuse is just as strong, but something that is brought to the Federation from outside, from a training practice or a situation, uh, maybe it could be abuse, it could be a number of different things, that happens outside of a competition ring and outside of a competition environment, so at home or somewhere else. And that video gets brought to us, and I'm going, and I'll, I'll just name it, like the, anybody know about the Helgestram thing? That's happening in Denmark, right? So if that is brought, that, you know, and that was thought about and planted, and I mean, that was, uh, you know, somebody plant, I mean, they, they went there looking for that. Um, but what happens if that got brought here? And it is underneath the level of abuse where a state is not gonna get, there's not gonna be a, you're not gonna charge it into a court Right? So it's not going to be at a state level, it's not going to be a federal level, like some abuse cases can obviously be where a horse is harmed in a, in a big way. Um, and it's underneath that, <laughs> and it's do we have the ability um, and should have the ability to be able to deal with that somehow in our world, right? If, if it's brought to us, not that we're going out hunting for it, but if it's brought to us, does the Federation have that ability to be able to deal with it through our legal process, right? Which 
would include obviously you know investigation and you know having an interview and people coming back and forth so both sides of the argument are, are shown right and then a determination is made take five minutes in your tables and talk a little bit about whether you feel like that actually can should how it could happen okay just in your groups and then and then we'll talk and then we'll come back and try to bring that view forward Let's have a little bit of this conversation and so we can have a little bit of a, even a kind of a pros and cons side of the equation, right? Not just, you know, going up or down. So it's a, we can have a little bit of a pros and cons and talk about the sides of the argument. So uh, this group here, 10, table 10, what's your, what's your view of whether you believe that the Federation should have the ability to have jurisdiction over something that, again, is outside, that's kind of under the courts, you know, it's not, not just all about abuse, but talk about training and what considers. So very much along what's happening around the world, and if that happened here, what would we do about it? Okay, here at our table, we discussed a few um, scenarios. Um, one of the key points was brought out was in, in a particular discipline that we have to clean our own house first. Um, we need to address situations that are going on in our own discipline, which, which we know about. And um, we talked about transparency. Um, just, uh, I mentioned that just today I got a um, press release on an announcement from the Helga Strand that um, they have, they now have implemented, you know, full-time cameras, day and night, all that. I mean, they're, they have addressed to what issue that they can address, but it's full transparency. Um, and then there's a due process which needs to be defined um, uh, and parameters of that and how can you actually implement the due process. Then there's the overall sphere of, uh, I think, believe it was yesterday, there was the discussion about it, we need to accept change because if we don't, it's going to be made for us, and we're at that era now in our sport. It can't be the way it used to be anymore because of the level of awareness, which is why the FEI and USAF have invested so much research into this. So it's a matter of uh, addressing each of our disciplines that this is a serious issue and to create an awareness of that. Is there anything else you wanted to make a point of? Okay. Okay. How about 14? Oh, wait. I have no idea. <laughs> I think it's all right. Okie doke. Y'all can hear me? Um, so we discussed that, I think purely from a, a social licensing standpoint, um, if this evidence is brought to us, we need to address it in some way, shape or form, and give the person an the other person an opportunity to respond to it. And we also talked about, um, particularly with the Helga Strand thing, um, that evidence was constructed by um, people with a specific intent, and so we had to also, we're considering how the evidence is presented to us and how it may have been edited and things like that. What else am I, guys, is there anything else? Um, Where do we draw the line? Yeah. One of the things that, it, it, it sounds good, but then where do you draw the line? Uh, do you, if it's quarter horses, or if it's walking horses that aren't in the USEF that is involved? Um, and uh, then what authority do, would the Federation have, uh, if, particularly if it's not a USEF member? And so it, it sounds good, and, but to actually implement it, it could be 
problematic. Do, do you, just as we throw a backside to here, do you believe that we would have jurisdiction to anybody that is actually not a member or a fan member? I don't think we would. I don't think. It would seem to me that we would only, looking at lawyers, it would seem to me that, that because I'm, I, can, I can feel the shepherd's crook coming off, get off the damn stage. <laughs> but yeah, um, no, I think there are jurisdiction, no, it has to be just with our, within, our, within our own family, right? With our own members. Uh, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't know if we would have the right or the jurisdiction outside of our own house. Right? I would. So it's got to be within our own house. Um, like the, you know, like the Danish Federation actually, you know, they suspended them and kicked them off the board and did a bunch of, so the Federation actually did something, right, to that group in, in Europe. Um, so I, I don't think we're talking about anything around the world, right? Um, I think we would be very careful to even comment on a lot of things that would, if it was brought up into the world. But I think we're actually just talking about our, in our own house. Uh, you guys? Yeah, Marty? We recognize this was a very complicated, complex issue, but one the USEF should not shy from just because of that. We also recognized that um, for a very long time, the USCF had jurisdiction over its competitions and it ended when the competition was over. However, we also recognized that with the implementation of safe sport, that changed the dynamic a little bit and safe sport doesn't end just at competitions. Therefore, we feel that there is a role for the USEF to extend beyond competitions, um, but it's complicated. We didn't come up with a lot of solutions, but we came up with a lot of uh, points and questions. One of the things we equated it to is uh, the improper activities with the equine is, has some similarities with domestic abuse. How far can you go? Where is the overreach? where's the privacy versus the responsibility to the animal that's potentially being mistreated. Um, a really interesting uh, concept came up at our table and that is having, we use the term ambassadors, at horse shows who identify horses that are maybe more stressed than you would normally expect or show some of the signs that Cammie and her group talked about and then looking for commonalities of trainers, riders, and things like that, and starting to scratch your head and say, hmm, are there things going on at home that's setting these horses up to be more stressed? Um, it does have to stay at the USCF membership level. The USCF can't reach beyond where, where its members are. We also talked about that if the USCF wanted to do something like this, it then needs to look at some of its um, larger language models. There's the sportsman's charter. Maybe that needs to get expanded and modernized so that the USCF has the language and the uh, technical things in place that it could begin to have a reach beyond competitions. But our consensus at our group was there is a role for the USCF to extend beyond competitions because what happens before and after affects the horses at competitions. And it's a complicated issue, but one that should not necessarily be shied from. Okay, great. So we have uh, the horseman's charter that the FEI is coming up with. I think that is a cool thing, right? Easy to get out to our memberships, but if anybody has ever looked at the <laughs> code of conduct that we have, right? The however many different things, 15 things that are in there. I will say that we've looked at that of trying to strengthen the code of conduct in ways that could be possibly used for this type of situation. Um, and so that is something that we're kind of investigating and looking into how we would change the code of conduct. Um, 
you guys? So, table one, stand, yeah? Thank you. Um, a couple of things came up with us, and, and I, th I think the main thing was that, yes, obviously USCF uh, I think has the authority and believe they have the authority from a member standpoint to do those things, uh, to investigate, to look at. But more importantly, the other side of this coin is that the affiliate bears responsibility to some of this. And I think uh, the developing culture that you have in your affiliate that you understand your disciplines and what's taking place there, you have to address that yourself. And a couple of things that came up is, um, you know, possibly developing a list of things that happen in your, your affiliates programs that you know can't be defended. And it, that's a hard, hard line when you start looking at that, but it's things that you have to be able to say to yourself, how can I defend this? When I know that it's wrong, even in your own discipline, it doesn't work. And so that's, that, you know, let's just say five things that you're going to find in your affiliate and then try to produce it from there so you can develop an educational process for all of us to look at that. That's it. Great. Uh, you guys, table three? Yeah? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess in a nutshell, not to repeat uh, some of the other comments, but I think we uh, agreed that uh, this should be a direction that USCF should take. Um, I think one of the other areas that we talked about was, uh, you know, kind of paralleling this to say sport and um, how that's evolved. Um, and the one question that we did, I maybe it was me that brought it forward, was the strength of state law to uh, reinforce, you know, back up and support a decision of USEF. Um, you know, I think that's going to be one of the challenges. Um, you know, for better or for worse, and depending on where you sit in this position, you know, horses are considered livestock in the U.S. Now, on many levels, that's a good thing. But when you get down to horse welfare, that may not be a good thing. Uh, because that, you know, that colors the state law, um, state by state. So I think that's a that's you know a big issue there. But I think overall we agree that this should be a direction that USCF should go. And I think as others have said, some of the documents that in, you know that we sign when we become a member and when we register our horses may have to be looked at to strengthen so that you can go beyond the competition grounds. Great, you guys, eleven. Well, basically, we agree with a lot of what's been said. I'm glad the safe sport uh, example was brought up because if we're, we have a role in protecting our uh, human athletes from abuse outside of the competition, don't we have a role in protecting our equine athletes as well? And uh, we definitely feel that the Federation should have a role in uh, hearing complaints and, and acting on them. We don't know if we currently have that authority, the legal structure is in place, but if not, it should be implemented, whether it's as we just mentioned, uh, having anyone who's a member who competes sign a document that says, I'm open to being investigated if there's ever a complaint, as a, as a condition of membership and competing. Um, someone mentioned you know, affiliates playing a role. I know in my breed, the Pasofinos, they see the uh, advantage of having USEF handle complaints as a real benefit of being an affiliate because they don't have that structure. So some affiliates may be in a better position to self-enforce than others. Great. Any other comments a little different or a con? Uh, Sally, yeah, down at the other end. And well, I will start right here since I'm right here. I think that one thing we haven't mentioned here that is missing is the professional license. It's something we have talked about for years and nothing that has been accomplished. And without a professional having a license to operate, uh, a business that is approved by the Federation, there is no teeth. So a member is a member, it's a junior member, it's a amateur member, it's a senior member, but a license for a professional is a different animal. 
And I think that's just one of the bigger parts of being, uh, making sure the public is aware that this person has been approved through a process to operate. So that would just be one of the things I would suggest we look into again. And your thought process from a license is as much about a competitive license as a trainer's license as a yes, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> it's all about the yes. All about the yes. The answer is a yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's it, and there's no question. Obviously, I'm very involved in the coaching thing and coaching licenses or trainer license. Uh, coaching licenses education is huge, um, and we have no stick. We have no stick to say you have to be now, you know, it's very, very, it's a very complicated system about how you would actually implement that on the grounds. You got to, you know, but in the end, it is something, as you have said, we it's something that we've talked about forever, but right now we're doing it on, you know, self-improvement more than trying to sell that side more than the stick of a license. And then we'll go down to sell it, yeah? Or, okay. I would, I would um, also just add that, you know, these are complex issues, right? But I think at the end of the day, there's lots of ways to say no. Everyone has to agree they want to say yes. And I think money will solve a lot of these issues. And if you have a good plan with what the current corporate environment is with ESG and doing well and being able to put um, their, to be able to, to show their constituents that they're doing things that are helping the wellness and welfare of animals or doing good in the world. The companies look for meaningful things to be able to invest in, in ESG and not just uh, ESG wash. And I think a really good plan that would show this would get funded in this environment very quickly because money's always gonna be the issue in a lot of these things, but this might be the time to be aggressive with plans and go out to corporations and put corporations behind the federation and it, it might just be all the factors coming together at once. That's a good point and probably a good lead in for right now we have to thank Mars Equestrian for uh, actually actually sponsoring you know sponsoring this. <laughs> I did not. I did not set him up for that, by the way. It was, uh, but it just <laughs> triggered in that. So we do really want to thank him. They sponsored this weekend and sponsored this, you know, this, these sessions. So uh, was Rob. There we go. I begrudging. This sounds weird for me because I like to talk a lot, but I am begrudgingly telling this story because I was, uh, I was my encouraged to do so. So our association, the U.S. Eventing Association, for about almost six years now, we've been in litigation over something uh, related to this. Um, you know, I'm going to back up a little bit and say in, in my um, career, one of, the, one of the previous jobs I had was overseeing an investigation, um, a, an entity uh, within the state government that did investigations on animal welfare. Actually, and I learned a lot about investigation and, and what needs to go into that. And I can tell you from our association as an affiliate, we are not equipped to do investigations uh, on animal welfare, especially off competition grounds. Um, so we do have a certification of trainer program and we have um, removed certification um, in the past and that's actually what led to the litigation. Um, and whether or not, I'm not gonna get into that, whether or not um, you know evidence that we have is, is sufficient, um, you have to realize you are going to get inevitably probably sued by somebody, right? And so you have to be prepared to do so. You have to be equipped to do so. Um, you know, we had, a, I think, the great suggestion, which I think I've heard from some of the other crews, is that at the end of the day, we probably do need something like a safe sport, a national safe sport for um, horse welfare. Um, because I think if, if, if you've been involved with it, you know, whenever we do receive a horse welfare call, especially off, off competition, um, we always help by providing, here's your local animal, you know, we actually investigate, okay, what, what is the local reporting agency? A lot of times it's a sheriff's department, sometimes it's a local humane, you know, group, et cetera. And it's so varied across the country. But if you've ever been involved with this, when that happens, inevitably, um, 
these investigators, these they deal with really bad situations. And when they go into a nice looking facility with horses that look relatively healthy, um, you know, it's it's very hard for them to take any action. So um, again, it's, it, it has to be a pretty clear, um, you have to have a pretty clear system on how you're gonna investigate this, how you're gonna follow up, how you're gonna uh, proceed. And again, um, you know, we talked as well about having people s sign away um, and accepting the responsibility or to provide care, or, you know, ethical treatment of these animals, et cetera. Um, but judge will tell you, you can't have people sign away everything. Um, and yeah, that's just my personal story. And we're still in litigation. It's been six years, so. Um. Um, our table discussed all of the things and brought up and uh, uh, same concerns that have been brought up by everybody else that's uh, talked this morning. Um, but it's also my understanding that there already is a rule change proposal uh, in the hopper that would allow uh, the Federation to, um, I can't remember how the rule change is worded, but um, investigate is probably, might be what it is. Um, the kinds of um, activities that we're talking about if it happened outside the competition, uh, uh, outside the competition ground. So for me, um, the fact that there is already a proposal in the hopper about this um, is a huge step forward. It, yes, it needs to pass, and that's, as we all have talked about and comments mentioned this morning, that's only the first step, and it gets complicated after that, but, it, but it's a, for me, it's an important first step. Me? Is this on? Hello. Yes. Um, I think we talked about something that, and this is very broad, but it's something that came up yesterday too when we were talking about, you know, what are some solutions. So um, it, it seems as if there were a, a voice for the horse. So how do you get a, go about doing that? So this is about, a, we talked about something like a horse welfare or tribunal, but this would be all organizations that deal with the horse coming to the table. So the responsibility wouldn't just be on USCF. Now, of course, these issues will come up and the things that Rob talked about, it's not, not going to go away. But it also is from the perspective of how the public looks at what's happening and talking about social license to operate. So if we have this horse welfare tribunal, just like there's now HISA for the racehorse. So it's, it shows that the effort, it shows that we're, we're coming together and trying to come up with solutions. You know, will that tribunal come up with the nose ban solution? You know, it, it may be passed down ultimately, but it shows that the horse is the number one stakeholder and that this voice for the horse are the organizations coming together. That's, that's the dream. <laughs> Great, thank you. Any other comments or? All right. Oh, yep. Um, so, what I'm wondering is um, whether you can um, use an incentive structure as effectively as trying to regulate. And thoughts that are just coming to me. You've talked about trainer certification, um, but that USEF s says, okay, there's a continuing education program. You know, you you do certain things and you uh, to keep your continuing education going, whether or not you're actually certified. You know, at what level or what all, but um, that then you get graded. So, you know, you have a facility or a trainer or whatever that is like a triple A. And that is based on not necessarily somebody coming out and judging them, but that they have participated in education that continues so that as USCF changes their standards for what they're requiring for um, 
welfare and training standards and so forth that you know it's it would be similar to what you're doing with having people sign something where the and and safe sport where you're just in order to have to, to reach a level that is granted by the USEF, you have to continually do these certain things. And so you're just continually exposed to them as, a, as an overall um, way of life, so to speak. So that was what I wanted to mention. Yeah, certainly the trainer certification, coaching certification, that lies within the affiliates has always been a <clears throat> fairly strong topic of conversation around, right? We, we and I really believe that the education into the horse side needs to come from there, which the modules of horse welfare are obviously a big, huge part of it. And then the USEF, we kind of started this other program about coaching as a whole, right? So and that's welfare about people, and, and but it's also, you know, it's just about how, how to teach, not what to teach, and feeling like the affiliates should real be in that side of the equation. So it's that, you know, it's that balance of where we are. I talked about it with the National Breeds and Disciplines the other day about, you know, would they be interested in this program that we've just started? Would they be interested in, in doing it? Because they don't really have, most of them don't have a certification process for trainers, right? Other ones are trying, it's hard. The Hunter Jumper Association has gone up and down to it. It's hard, it's a hard system. The eventing's been in it for 20 years, I guess, and dressage is the longest, and most formal for 25 years, I think, that they've been into that into that process. So, you know, it's just something to investigate, it's something to look into more as we give more opportunities down to, I think, our members for that type of thing. And all of those have the uh, horse welfare module. So I hear that in the end that the code of conduct probably needs to be strengthened. We need to look into the little bit, the jurisdiction side of it. We feel like there's a direction that this is a direction that we should go down. Everybody's fairly unanimous. It feels like they're fairly unanimous about that. So how do we do that code of conduct? There is a rule in the hopper that says that we would have that, that process. I would like for all of you guys to go, maybe go back and take a look at that recommendations as you go forward for that rule that gets passed in, when's the, so by mid-year in June is when they're kind of, that comes in, that could come into play. So um, you know, please go back as your groups and take a look at that ag again. Um, otherwise, I really want to thank everybody for their participation this morning. Uh, thank you very much to Dr. Haleski for coming in. And I want to thank all of you guys for really you know, being in the place that you are willing to go there, right? You're willing to talk about it. Uh, we're going to have, we have another session this afternoon, which could be quite interesting. Um, and we'll have other conversations maybe about some of the things that you wrote down uh, yesterday. Um, so thank you very much for your participation because this is the way to, we've got to get together and talk about it and not just do it in back rooms or somebody else makes the decision. You guys, you guys have to drive the bus, I think. So, um, we just have to provide a bus, I guess. So, um, so thank you very much. Uh, we'll have a break, and um, and then we will see you here this afternoon. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.